are rage, brutal, without mercy. But you, you will be worse. Hey guys, this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and MSI, so stick around until the end to find out how you can get your hands on the ultimate play with the MSI GF76 gaming laptop. Well, here's a video I never thought I'd be making, and that's a video where I actually review Scorn. Yeah, a game which I've been following for so long now that I don't even have access to the email account that I used to have when I backed it on Kickstarter. What year is it? Yeah, Scorn is a game with an interesting development history, but none of that really matters anymore because the whole thing is finally out. And 2022 is a year that's just constantly surprising me. Not only did I finally get to play that original E3 build for Duke Nukem Forever, but also Dead Island 2 and Routine both got a release date. And if you had have told me even a year ago that all of these things would have come to pass, well, I would have had to get a fire hose out and spray your pants. Because you'd be a liar liar pants on fire. That was awful. Anyway, after having finally beaten Scorn's four or so hour long campaign up, gotta say I think I'm pretty happy with what Ebb Software have managed to pull off here, mostly. Let's get one thing clear right away though, this is not the type of game that everyone is going to enjoy. It's going to leave you feeling like you need a hot shower and a hug when the whole thing comes to an end. And from start to finish, it's a hopeless, depressing journey through a relentless world that absolutely hates you. But then again, that's kind of what the whole thing's going for. So in that regard, I mean, I guess they nailed that experience. Now, as far as I can tell, there's not really any kind of story to go off here, and the game begins with your character, the Scorn Guy, just waking up and beginning this journey throughout this harsh, desolate world. Where everything is either already dead, or trying to make you that way. Almost everything you interact with tries to hurt you, and throughout the campaign, this guy's going to go through more undeserved pain and suffering than Brendan Fraser. Though at least Brendan gets his happy ending. I salute you. The gist I get from the story here is that you're supposed to be someone walking through the corpse of this collapsed, unnamed civilization. There's hints about the story that there's been maybe some kind of virus or something that's wiped these guys out. Or maybe just like in real life, it's the natural progression for a great civilization, an empire, to eventually crumble and fall apart. In any other game like this, you'd come across audio logs or get narration explaining what's happened. Scorn, though, doesn't do any of that. It just kind of throws you into the game, giving minimal environmental storytelling, and it just never bothers to fill in the blanks. Either way, though, this thing looks like H.R. Geiger's worst nightmare, or, I don't know, his wet dream. And despite its monotone color palette, this is still one of the most visually stunning games I've played in recent memory. Artistically, I think this is just a ridiculously good-looking game and hands down one of the most creative and unique game worlds I think I've ever explored. The way that I describe the visuals I think is kind of like concept art in motion, combined also with some really gross body horror that I can't even show here because of the nanny state that YouTube's turned into. Performance wise, it was okay, though it was definitely jittery when I entered new areas, and although you can change that FFV if you really want to, the game outright warns you not to, but you know what, at least the option's still there. I will say though, what kind of surprised me was that there wasn't as much phallic imagery as I expected. I mean, don't get me wrong, you'll still see the old structure off in the distance that looks like a cock, but I mean, that's about as far as it ever goes. I just did a video on a bunch of crappy Unreal Engine 5 remakes talking about all these soulless videos that look like they've been mass produced to generate AdSense money, and to go from that to then playing something like this, where the world is incredibly striking and just pure screenshot bait, you know, is quite the contrast. Scorn never takes you out of this world either, aside from like a few times when you lose consciousness for various reasons or if you're killed, you never have to stare at any loading screens when you enter all these new areas, you get to experience this seamless journey from beginning to end. Looking down you'll see your arms and your torso and interacting with objects you'll feel like they've got a sense of purpose. So it's kind of ironic how this world is so alien and hostile, yet also still feels so believable and lived in. HUD is also minimal to not clutter the screen up with needless information like your health or your ammo counters, with that information coming only on the screen when absolutely necessary. And I mean, even then, it's about as inconspicuous as a mosquito in a circus tent. I do think my total playtime would have at least been about 30 minutes shorter too, had I not spent so much time here just staring off into the distance and taking screenshots of all these weird structures. So yeah, man, this game looks good. Damn good, and much like your mum, it proves that you can still find beauty in something hideously ugly. 
Now, if I had to describe the gameplay, which I kind of do, I guess, I'd say it's a combination of a first-person shooter crossed with a walking simulator. No shit. Now, I categorize a walking simulator as something that's just about walking around the world you're in without, you know, any real threats to deal with. Whereas a first-person shooter is where you have to use in-game mechanics to survive, right? And off that definition, I think Scorn does both of these well enough for it to keep your attention. For the most part. You see, the big problem this game has is that for the first or so hour, it is just painfully slow. They released a preview build for this game a few weeks back, which was like the first 45 minutes or so of the campaign. And I think that was actually kind of for the game's detriment, because for all of this starting period, you've got no weapons. And the puzzles during these sequences are arguably some of the most confusing in the whole game. More so too, because you're probably not used to the interface by that point. You're given no indication of where to go or what to do, which is fine. I mean, that's kind of the point of the whole game. But that right there, that whole opening is going to turn off a hell of a lot of people. Heading off and exploring, you'll find this puzzle that requires shuffling and moving around all of these weird little egg type things, trying to get the one you need to a specific spot so you can crack it open and wake up a creature that's lying dormant inside. And this puzzle alone, man, honestly took me upwards of, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 minutes the first time I played it. And this is really the first puzzle in the entire game. In fact, I think I spent more time on this puzzle than I'd spent with the entire game up until that point. You are one pathetic loser. Anyway, once you finally figure that thing out, you've then got to push this poor defenseless looking abomination along a bunch of rails, while those sad eyes peer out at you in a combination of confusion and fear. You gotta use this guy's hand to get through a locked door, and you can go about this by either just killing him and taking it off his corpse, which is horrific and made me feel fucking awful, or you can instead break him out of his shell where he survives, helplessly shuffling along behind you like some kind of poor deformed puppy dog. Watching this poor guy try to get to his feet is just weirdly heartbreaking too. It's like watching a baby giraffe try to walk for the first time, and the thought that the first thing this creature's ever known in its existence is to be carted around like a piece of meat is just really sad, man. So I don't really know which one of these options made me feel the worst. I mean, I think killing him is the merciful thing to do here because at least it's kind of quick and he doesn't have to suffer anymore. Leaving him alive seems more humane, but he's surely going to die eventually anyway, right? Regardless of the way you choose to go though, you end up in another area where you've then got to load up these giant testicles into some kind of pillar to power up, I don't know, something up. Along with getting the first weapon, which is kind of like a handheld jackhammer crossed with the Xenomorph's inner jaw. At this point, you do finally get to kill stuff, but it's really only getting rid of like a minor nuisance that stands in the way of finishing this next puzzle before you're then again thrown back into more walking around, this time on the surface of whatever desolate shithole planet you're stuck on. Now this kind of opening might have been fine for like an 8 hour game, but consider now that Scorn only really lasts 4 or so hours. So this means for the first 25% of it, you're really not doing all that much. Aside from maybe feeling like a horrible person for using a living creature like they're a meaningless tool. Even once you do finally get into some combat a good 30 to 45 minutes later, your only weapon is still going to be that jackhammer thing. And for some stupid reason, they made it so you can only use it twice before then having to wait like 5 seconds for the whole thing to recharge. Early on, you're fighting enemies that kind of look like they've come out of someone's intestinal tract, along with what can only be described as rotting rotisserie chickens, both of which spit projectiles. <laughs> And these guys either take five shots from the jackhammer, or for those charcoal chicken rejects, two shots. And it just makes killing them an absolute chore. It's kind of like the game wants you to simply run past and avoid these guys, but quite often that's not really possible because of how cramped some of the environments are. And then fighting them ain't that great either, because you can't do much more here than just move backwards as they approach, in between just battering them in the face with your little dildo gun. And you're probably going to die a fair bit here until you get the hang of it. Keep in mind too that the checkpoints in this game are incredibly sporadic, and you don't even get any kind of on-screen prompt here as to when you've passed one either, which is really odd to me. I mean, a simple, non-obstructive icon in like the top of the screen to give you the most basic courtesy of letting you know you've reached a safe spot has to be one of the most simple quality of life mechanics a video game can have. These first few combat sequences are a clunky, frustrating introduction to how combat works, one that you'll get a good chance to experience over, over, and over.
And during all of this, you're still solving puzzles, which might be fine if you weren't having Colonel Sanders' little nightmare spitting spunk at you the entire time. Or these walking prolapsed anuses chasing after you either. I do also think the puzzles can have a bit of a stop-start effect, because you're going from moving through these environments to then suddenly stopping on one of these puzzles and having to mess around with it for like 10 minutes. From early up to later in the game, these puzzles just feel like gigantic speed humps. Like this one here, for instance, you've got to spin these fuse things around to make a connection across the board, I suppose. And I can see that there's markings on these circular bits, but how it's all supposed to join up, I really do have no idea. So to go from exploring this eerie artistic environment at a really steady pace to then spending 15 minutes staring at the same puzzle, I don't know man, it totally kills the vibe at times. It'd be like, imagine going to an art gallery and then just when you finish walking through the contemporary art section, the tour guide has you stand in front of a brick wall for 15 minutes and then smash your head into it over and over. I guess my point is that I wouldn't blame someone for not wanting to play past this stuff, and it almost kind of got to the point for me where I really started wondering whether or not it was even worth to stick the whole thing out. But then I remembered a video I did a while back for a game called Soma, a walking simulator minus the shooting mechanics, which even to this day I really feel like I didn't give enough chance to and kind of completely missed the point. It's kind of haunted me ever since how I didn't quite understand what the game was trying to do, and more than that, I gave it a negative review to top the whole thing off. It was like they were trying to get me to play chess, and I was asking for a baseball bat. Oh, thanks for being so helpful. So playing Scorn was going to be my Soma Redemption run, and I said to myself that even if I don't like the game, I'll at least give it the basic decency of finishing it without being a salty douchebag. And I gotta say that I'm glad I did, because the game starts to improve exponentially from the point where you finally get a gun. Also too, finally, one of these games that actually gives you a fucking gun. I'm just so sick of playing those games where I have to run away from all the big bad monsters. I really just hope that trend in gaming is finally dying off. Anyway, you've essentially got four weapons here. You've got the starting jackhammer thing, which thankfully you won't have to use much after getting the second weapon, which is more or less a pistol. This thing holds a bunch of shots before needing to be reloaded and does slightly more damage than the jackhammer, which is a good thing, so you don't have to go toe to toe with enemies anymore. After that, there's what's more or less like a rifle doing much more damage than the pistol, but reloading a lot slower and also holding less shots. Then finally, you've got like, I don't know, essentially a grenade launcher, though this thing is more tied to the narrative and a couple of puzzles instead of being something you're gonna be using a lot in combat. Scorn's also got a bit of a survival horror vibe to the whole thing, where ammo and healing items are kind of limited, so you really have to make each shot count. You come across healing items and ammo in what's basically these organic vending machines, which is, you know, about the best way I can describe them. Imagine buying a packet of chips out of something that looks like the inside of someone's reproductive system, and yeah, that's about the gist of it. Now, not every single enemy has to be killed here, but there are times when you're all but forced into combat, and missing shots isn't ideal because reloading and swapping weapons is painfully slow. Now, this is, of course, by design, but look, I've got to say, if I had any of these enemies coming at me in real life, I can guarantee I'd be reloading my guns with a bit more gusto. Oh. One hour later... I actually started playing through this for the first time with the mouse and the keyboard, but kind of feel like playing it with the controller is much more natural. For starters, I mean, the combat is just kind of slow paced, but then you spend the other 50% of the game here walking around, so just kind of felt like playing with the controller was more natural, and remove the erratic aiming I naturally have when playing with the mouse. One day I might stop playing PvE games like I'm sweating online in Rainbow Six Siege, but today, it's not that day. It also meant that aiming and firing weapons was more slower and deliberate, and it took me that extra half second to make sure my shots were lined up, because god help me if I missed too many shots and had to reload. The organic nature to all of the weapons is also really creative, it's kind of like you're connecting different appendages and body parts when you're swapping through weapons, and there's kind of something subconsciously unsettling about the way everything looks. I can't think of too many first-person shooters that have weapons like this either. Half-Life Opposing Force comes to mind. Also, the weapons in Prey felt like they were living and breathing, as did a few of the guns in Perfect Dark, but I think really that's about it. Just kind of taps into that common phobia of weird shit. Even that little pouch thing you've got that holds your healing items and remaining ammo plays into the whole trypophobia meme that came out a few years back, which I think kind of makes sense too, given how long this game's been in development. 
It does all seem kind of confusing visually at first, but when the whole thing clicks, and then for the last couple of hours when you've got a bunch of ammo and enemies to kill, is the absolute apex of the whole experience. And it ends up being an oddly satisfying combat system, you know, even if it is pretty damn simple. Most enemies don't need much more than just kind of staying out of their melee range while shooting at them with whatever weapon you've got ammo for. But I think the combination of the sound work and the animations just makes the whole thing feel really smooth and satisfying to play. And I think it's a good example of how not every single FPS game needs to have fast weapon swapping, dashing and glory kills. I mean look man, I like those things as much as the next guy, but sometimes all you need in a first person shooter is to be able to shoot a rotting chicken at point blank range with a flesh pistol. <laughs> I guess my point too is that it's not the most challenging combat system, and it's kind of funny too how accessible the shooting is considering every other element in the game is just so incredibly niche and unforgiving. And I guess overall my main complaint about the shooting is that I just wish there was more of it. Oh yeah, I think it's worth mentioning too, don't expect any hand holding with how any of this stuff works. When you give it a new weapon or some kind of item, outside of seeing your character grab it physically, they give you no other indication as to how the whole thing works or what it even is. I mean, I didn't even realise I had a health bar until about two hours into the game. Though in fairness, that's not entirely my fault or the devs for that matter. It's just that for someone like me who's red green colourblind, that barely visible bar on the top left of the screen was almost impossible to see. So overall, it's just kind of a weird experience, making Scorn the kind of game that's definitely not going to appeal to everyone, having that weird mix of walking sim, puzzles, and shooting. One thing it also definitely isn't, at least as far as I'm concerned, is a horror game. Not by a long shot. I mean, I would say it's kind of creepy here and there, and there's some sections with the body horror that are definitely going to make you feel uneasy, but I don't think there's a single jump scare in the entire game. And short of a sequence where you're being stalked by something that looks like a hammerhead shark crossed with a stingray, there's never really any kind of sense of impending doom or gloom. Scorn never takes any kind of cheap jabs at the player, and to be honest, I actually kind of appreciate that. I mean, it's kind of good in that way that it's not going to appeal to low-hanging fruit streamers who just play the horror game of the week to get some cheap views. You know, the same ones who have thumbnails that make it look like they're catching a cactus plant with their butthole. What it definitely is though, is a depressing experience. It's set in a cruel and unforgiving world, and it ends feeling cruel and unforgiving. If you're expecting there to be some kind of resolution, or anything remotely resembling a happy ending, well, then like me, prepare to be disappointed. Your character is a blank slate from the get-go, and they end the game much in the same way, I think arguably even worse off. And I think, looking back on it, I don't really have an issue with this. I mean, it's definitely the tone they're going for, but I do think it's funny how long I waited to play a game like this that really left me feeling like a depressed piece of shit. You know, as opposed to most days of the week where I just feel like a normal piece of shit. Damn it! Finally, I can see a lot of people complaining about the length here, which took me just under four hours to get through. But to be honest, I don't think I'm going to complain about that. And I think anyone who plays a game like this and expects a 10 to 12 hour long campaign is just kidding themselves. It feels like it ends right around the time when it's starting to lose its appeal. And to be honest, that's the best thing it could have done. And I don't need another four hours of shooting more enemy types or solving more complex and obtuse puzzles. Regardless of the outcome and what the rest of the world thinks, I still think App Software have created something truly unique here. And visually alone, there's really no other game quite like it. Has it been worth the wait though? Well, yes and no, but to be honest, I'm just glad I finally got to play it. Now all we need is a release date for Bloodlines 2 and I can finally, finally eat my previous words. <laughs> Right, so thanks for sticking around, and now let me tell you about the MSI GF76 laptop, built for the ultimate play. Now there's a bunch of these you can choose from, but recently MSI sent me one with an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 and second gen RT cores. So I threw a few games at this thing to see how they ran, and I gotta say I was actually pretty surprised with the results. With games like Spider-Man Remastered, Ghostwire Tokyo, and God of War all running completely maxed out, not to mention they had RTX on as well. The benefit of that Nvidia card also means you can utilize DLSS for even better frame rates and a much higher fidelity. You've got a 17.3 inch HD screen here with a 240Hz refresh rate, and that Max-Q technology allows for better performance without turning this thing into a giant brick either. With dedicated thermal solutions for the GPU and the CPU, using more heat pipes than even your mum can handle, it means the performance doesn't come at the cost of the whole thing overheating. Which overall just makes this thing a bit of a beast for offline gaming at 1080p. 
The GF76 also has the benefit of high resolution audio output and lossless music, you know, for when you want to listen to Taze on day. So overall, I think this thing's pretty damn awesome. And if you want to find out how to get your hands on one of them, well, check out the link in the video description below.